Good evening, guys and gals. Um, oh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. This is really an honor and a, a, a pleasure for me to be here. So today's topic, just to make sure you are on the right meeting at the right place and what you're expecting, let's set level, uh, uh, level set expectations. We're going to be talking about ETL, extract, transform transformation, and a lot of data. So we're going to be fo focusing on data uh, for a little bit. Uh, Show of hands, how many of you guys work really, uh, had some work that has to do with data, database administrator, database developers, BI? All right. All right, I think probably like one or two. No, I saw more hands. Okay. So, so let's see. The agenda is pretty simple. Three main points I want to uh, make sure come across. One is, let's start talking about ETL, understanding what ETL and what ETL is not. And then we're going to uh, try to look at what's happening on the cell service area, OK? On the cell service area in the context of business intelligence. I got a demo from a technology from a tool, Microsoft uh, Power BI, Power Query, which is part of uh, Power BI. And then a little bit of discussion I would like to. I have some points that I can discuss, but I, I, instead of me telling you what I think, I would like to also hear from you guys. Maybe after the break, we, we have a little bit of an open conversation and see if in terms of ETL, if we are there yet or not to do uh, some sort of cell service. That's basically the, the uh, plan for tonight. Uh, I don't think there is much on here that you haven't heard. Um, I'm currently working for uh, Ally as an enterprise architect. I, I do the, all that has to do with data and information architecture there. Uh, and other than that, regular family guy as well, three kids, uh, wonderful wife. I like, when I'm not doing IT, um, when I'm uh, spending fi uh, time with my uh, family, I like also to, to run. Uh, this is picture from my last half marathon with my wife down on Kiwa Island. Let's see. So now let's, let's jump in into, into the topic, OK? And I wish I could move a little bit more around, but uh, let's, let's try to do this the, way, the best way. First of all, let's start uh, talking about what ETL has been uh, traditionally, right? ETL has been that uh, system that has been in place to move data around, right? And it stands for extract. You go to data sources, one or multiple data sources, you do something with the data, and you load it, right? And it typically done by IT. Typically, say, if, if it's done correctly, it might be a very responsive uh, system, might be uh, very robust, reliable. It runs on a schedule. So more or less looks like something like this. If you're not familiar with data warehousing, business intelligence solutions, so let me, let me do a, a quick walk through this. All it starts at the bottom. Let's read it uh, uh, at, from the bottom up. The data sources, right? A lot of companies don't, ha don't have just one system, have many systems. Data is laying around multiple data sources. Then the data integration engineers or architects come together to try to gather that information and typically populate another database, call it data warehouse, call it data mart, uh, an operational data store. And that's where probably most of the work, the heavy lifting goes before that data can be uh, published and consumed by end users via analytics tools, via reporting tools, via dashboards. Is that a fair description of a typical solution? OK? So, so what we're going to be doing is basically that thing on the circle, the data integration piece. Um, let's see. All right. And, and th what happens is a lot of people tend to simplify this, right? This is just about gathering data, doing something with it, and delivering. Well, that's true. That's the, the core, if you will. The, 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 uh, a functional specification of the system might be that, right? But there are also a, a lot of non-functional things that uh, a lot of users or the business give us a grant, right? And the thing is, hopefully you want that system to run based on a scale that has some logging uh, capabilities. Depending on which industry do you work, depending on what data you're working with, you might be subject to some, some auditing uh, requirements. 
you might need to monitor the system. The, the system might be very complex. It doesn't take 30 minutes or one hour anymore. Now it takes four to five to six hours. It is not uncommon to have ETL systems running overnight. Uh, you know, the, win the low window might be from 10 p.m. to 6 in the morning, so the reports, dashboards, and everything is ready to consumption in the morning. You have to be also worried about archiving and purging, right? It's great to be accumulating data, but at some point you might need to start thinking about rolling out and archiving data. If something happens in the middle of a process, hopefully the system needs to be uh, smart enough to be able to recover at the point of failure. So there is a lot of uh, plumbing and back end, and you guys are IT. You, uh, depend, regardless on which part of IT do you work, you know that sometimes uh, the part of the solution that you work, there is that little tip of the iceberg that the user sees, but they don't see a lot of the complexity that goes behind the scenes, okay? So ETL is, is, is nothing different than that. Uh, and obviously, it is, it is done by IT, and it also faces challenges, right? Just to give you some, some numbers, uh, every time that you have a data warehouse or uh, some data-related project, 70, between 70 to 80% of your budget, of your time, will go into putting the ETL solution together, okay? Reports, you can build them like this when the data is structured and available for you to consume. What takes a lot of time is to structure the data and to populate and transport that data, okay? So that type of solution obviously needs the help of IT, all of us here, um, but on this space we have a little bit of a bad reputation, right? We move at the speed of IT, okay? Because it's not just transporting the data one time, you want this system to be reliable and robust and we are subject to a lot of um, uh, processes and policies that are in place for a good reason. And more often than not, this is probably the soft part is we might not get it right the first time, okay? There might, the, 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 mis the miscommunication or the communication dynamics that goes between IT and the business for saying this is what I think I need from my data. From, and when you, uh, it is like an iterative process until you get it to the right, to the right state, right? One, data quality might be an issue. Two, just the, the, the sense of, of the, uh, the dynamics of the communication. They're speaking business. We're speaking maybe tables, joins, uh, intersection of data. Uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and lastly is um, just the same dynamics of business intelligence, right? The, the business might have a business question that needs a certain number or, or data set. By the time that we provide that, they, are, they have two or three follow-up questions that require additional cycles to get more data, right? And so we tend to, to, to do it, but we tend to move very slow, right? By the way, questions are welcome anytime, so feel free just to raise your hand and I'll, I'll make sure that everybody has a chance to, to uh, get your, answer, uh, your an answer to your question. So that's how it has been traditional for ETL. Now, with that being said, with a lot of needs by the business around data and with IT not being able to uh, move quickly enough, obviously I create, I created situations like on the business side. Business are expected, analysts, uh, decision makers are expected to, to uh, take action a lot quicker, okay? The, the, the business world is moving a lot faster than it used to move 15, 20 years ago. For moving that quick, they need access to reliable and data that help them uh, supporting their decisions. But what happened is the, the environment itself has got in a, a complex as well, right? Now we're not just talking about those uh, well-structured data sources, rows and columns. Now we might be talking about larger data sets, big data, anybody, um, social media, unstructured data, sensor data. Things are changing, uh, the, the data landscape have changed tremendously in the last few years or the last decade probably uh, that is making the operation of this system a lot more complex. And obviously they are always looking for creative ways to work around the constraints. IT sometimes being a one of those constraints, right? So you heard the term, you might have heard the term of spread marts, right? You might have heard the, the term of that person that is running uh, his PC 
uh, 24 by 7 because he has so many macros in Excel or an access database that has become a mission critical application just because nobody in IT was able to stand it up on time so they took the time and now you have these um, solutions out on the woods, right? So that's on the business side. On the IT side, the, the big switch, right? now. Like I said, the data has, has changed shape and size mainly. A lot larger data sets, a lot of uh, different data types that are coming our way, different more complex data transformation rules. The rapidly uh, nature of the requirements or how rapidly the requirements are changing. Uh, it is now natural. I mean, we used to try to lock down the users using our waterfall. Uh, delivery uh, uh, methodologies saying give me the requirements of all your reports, right? That doesn't work anymore because by the time that you deliver the first report, they have a different questions. Or by the time that you deliver the first report, they realize, well, they just made a mistake. That's, that's not the data that they need. The, the data analytics process is iterative in nature, right? So that, that's, that's one of the uh, pressure points that we're feeling on IT because we're trying to apply software development life cycle methodologies to analytics life cycle problems. Um, and obviously the, the budget part, right? I think the numbers, the last numbers that I checked, they were, uh, they were, uh, were saying that the data, um, data volumes are growing 50% year over year. Okay, so a lot more data, you need more resources, you need more, more people working on it, but the budget are not, the budget, the IT budgets are not, are not growing at the same pace, right? So a little bit of a, a mismatch there in terms of uh, amount of work and, and the resources of budget available. So let's see what is happening on, on, on the cell service area, right? It has, been, it has gone mainstream, not only on IT, but it has been around for, for many, many years, right? From the time that we go to the supermarket, uh, by the time that we could do a, a check-in at the airport, renting uh, a, a movie, anybody remember, what was it? Blockbuster, right? No, not anymore, right? Uh, when was the last time that you guys have to go to your, your uh, bank, to the actual brick and mortar branch? I don't know you guys, but I just go there if, I don't know, I haven't gone in many, many months, right? Those guys have done it right. We can say anything about the banking industry, but I think they have gone the sell service thing right. You can do it online, you can do it uh, over the web, you, uh, uh, over the phone. Now you have an application, you have ATM machines, you don't really need to go there, right? So, and I think that has probably started creating some level of expectations across the board, right? And especially on IT, I mean, where are the technologists, right? Where are the ones that make this possible? So this is the definition by Gardner of business intelligence, okay? And it's really around end users designing and deploying their own solution, if you will, analytics. Solution in this way, in this, in this context, would be reports and, and al analysis. Now, they, they do a favor to IT saying, with an approved and supported architecture and tools portfolio, hopefully. Thanks, Gardner. But that, that's not always the case, right? And, and IT has got, uh, the business, some business units has, has gotten uh, purchasing power. They might sometimes be able to even buy servers, engage consulting companies, and do things in parallel uh, from, from what we can deliver as a part of IT. So this definition is great, but it made me wonder um, one thing, right? And for you to design and deploy a report and analysis, what do you need? What is the core thing of a report? Anybody? Data. Data. Thanks. All right. So that's the question is, okay, in the context of cell service, okay, great that you can define the, your reports, but where are you going to get the data, okay? So I think this, this cell service uh, BI might need to acknowledge the fact that assuming is making the assumption that you have data resources available, right? And, and this is where I would like us to explore solutions, right? So now, in the context of cell service BI, not only for creating or consuming reports, 
let's let's look into how to tap and do stuff with the data on a self service fashion okay so for a moment let's 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 try to build the balance right because it has been out of balance because for years well people uh, users can do it in excel and IT has been chasing those Excel nightmares or Excel hells for a long time, right? Because they built hundreds of Excel uh, workbooks and, and nobody says anything until it's broken. And when it's broken, who they're gonna call? IT, right? By the time that we get there, it's too late, it's very complex, very costly, very frustrating. So the ideal scenario, I think, would be having a, a technology or a solution that for the users, Empower them, right? Give them access to, to more data sources. Give them more complex data transformations capabilities, okay? There are, are any Excel advanced user here? Almost. Yeah, almost, okay, there are a few, there are a few. I know, I know you guys, I know you guys can do a lot of uh, cool things in Excel, okay? Uh, those macros, those, you know, a lot of data wrangling, data, data transformations, um, and being able to to provide value to, to the business. But what if we will give, if, if we are able to give you a tool that has more complex data transformations, even the, uh, with some degree of reusability, data refresh, uh, maybe sharing capabilities, but while keeping, uh, w without relying that much on IT. And on the IT side, obviously, hopefully, that will translate into a relief uh, valve because now, uh, when we push the data, um, the data problem to the end users, at least portion of it, and, and this is part of the question that we want to answer at the end of the presentation, is how much can we push to the end users and keep the balance? Obviously, um, being able for IT to probably shift the role of instead of delivering data, maybe enabling access to the data. What about if IT has now the ability to maybe start capturing and, and establishing and delivering new patterns for produce and consume data? So it's not just me taking note, being an order taking, going to the shop where my developers are, uh, put, placing the order and waiting for them to get it wrong one, two, three times until we finally deliver. But what if uh, we can make that shift of roles, right? So on that context is that we're gonna be examining Power Query, okay? So what is Power Query? On two lines is, it's just a tool, obviously, that is gonna allow us uh, to go around data, do the searches, access, connect, transform, and deliver data to, uh, to the end users' um, computers, okay? Power Query, is part of a larger family called Power BI. Uh, there are other components which we're not gonna be covering, but for the sake of giving you enough context, let me just mention it. Uh, you also have Power Pivot. Once that the data is captured, you need to store that data somewhere. Well, micro, Microsoft have developed this in-memory database engine, which is now part of, of Power Pivot. It's all, uh, part of Excel, it's called Power Pivot, but it's also part of SQL Server. So think about Power, uh, Power Pivot being the, the, uh, the younger sibling of SQL Server uh, analysis services tabular model. So in-memory database engine. Uh, why is it important that it's in-memory? Because it's faster, okay, it's faster. Um, highly optimized compression data. So it's, not, it's faster because it's in memory and it's because it's highly, highly optimized for analytics. Once you transform data and you load it into a database or an in-memory model, what is the next thing or the final piece of, the, uh, the final piece of, the, of this? Is to create the data visualization, data presentation, right? So for that you have your, your power view or power maps. All this experience available in the end user's laptop via Excel or via Power BI Designer, which we're gonna touch on it uh, briefly in a moment. Now, all this is available in Excel and is, uh, air quotes, free. It's free if you own Excel, or it's free if you go and download something called Power BI Designer. It's still on preview mode, okay? It's not, it's not really, it, it, does, it hasn't reached the, I don't know how they call it nowadays, but it hasn't uh, uh, 
reach the release state. Um, so this, this portion is free if you own Excel or if you download Power BI. Now, typically, uh, what, you, what do you want to do next after you have created a cool report that, I th that you boss think is, is highly valuable? The next thing is maybe share it, right? Share it with a larger audience. Maybe make it the official report, the official dashboard for your department or for your company. That's where the second component of Power BI uh, is, right? And having the ability to share, find, maybe consume the report on mobile devices and so forth. So it's, think about your, your server experience or your share experience. The only caveat is it's in the cloud. Right? Now is everything is on the cloud. Have you guys heard about Azure? I'm unsure, right? So uh, Power BI is think about uh, an optimized uh, uh, service for BI anal analytics, okay? Anything that you can create and consume on your Power BI that you develop on your desktop now can be uploaded and shared uh, in the cloud and in the Power BI service. So you get the left-hand side for free on the right hand side pay. It's a very smart model if you ask me, right? It's that free freemium model. You can start developing and after you get people excited about how cool and how easy it is to produce report, I want more of this, I want all my department to use it, sure. Just you know, enter your credit card number and, and you will have that part of the experience. Okay? So for power P, for Power Query and in general any Power BI development tool you, I, I, now I'm calling it the old way and the new way. One is you can do it on Excel. Uh, the second is you can do it on, on a, a specially dedicated tool for Power BI called the Power BI Designer. Both of them are free. The only thing is for the Excel, you have to have Excel, okay? Uh, it supports Power Query, supports Excel 2010 and Excel 2013. Uh, Power BI Designer is a standalone uh, desktop tool, so you don't need, you don't have any constraints against Excel version. Any questions so far? Um, I'm not sure exactly the way, we're just, what are the size of companies that are interested in this? Are they, are they companies that already have an, an installed base of Excel and um, hmm. So, so the, the question is, just to repeat the question for everybody, what are the target or the type of companies that Microsoft is, is targeting in terms of size? Um, so that, that's a great question. I don't know. It, it, by the way, anybody using Power BI already on your workplaces or know about Power BI? A little bit? Just kicking the titles or is your company using, using it for production? You know about just yes, so, so, some awareness. Okay, anybody else? It's not as 365 in 2014, right? It used to be part of Office 365, so hmm, a little bit of history here, and then we'll try to answer Houston's question. So, the preview solution, the, so on, on the new service, there is a preview. They, for, for one, they junk it out outside, outside of Excel. Okay, they don't want to be married outside uh, with Excel anymore. And for the cloud part, they also junk it out of Office 365. They don't want to be married to Office 365 anymore. And I think it makes sense because what happened is they make it a premium of Office 365. If you were interested in only BI capabilities, you have to buy all these to get your small BI piece. So now they are standing, standing up a, a Power BI service you log in, you pay, it's only about Power BI. You don't need to consume all the SharePoint online, Office 365, yada yada that you had to pay before. So I think it makes sense to decouple those because I think even internally the, develop, the developers, uh, the development team, the product team has to be in sync with Excel, in sync, in sync with Office 365. Now I think they have a little more freedom to operate. And for the end user is you just buy uh, what you need. You don't need to be part of something bigger. I don't know what the story is going to be for customers, but I'm an Office 365 customer now. You are making me branch out. So I, I don't know how they are going to fix that, that part of the problem. But, um, but anyway, to Houston's question about who is the target companies, that's a great question that I have myself. Uh, it has to be, I think, probably, I, I don't know in terms of size, but in terms of industry, 
it has to be an industry that is not highly regulated because the shared story is you have to upload your data to the cloud or has uh, some components, some agents on the cloud that can connect to your in-house data bases, right? So your transactional system maybe to extract the data. So I know the highly regulated companies, security architects, if there is any here, uh, are gonna say, hmm, let's have a conversation, right? I don't think that that's gonna fly. So I know I work for a financial institution, data on the cloud or anything accessing our data resources from the cloud is probably a no-no unless that something big happens, right? Uh, so that I would I would say in terms of industry would be a, a less regulated industry. In terms of size, I don't know. Uh, based on the capabilities and based of, of what I see, maybe a, a more maybe if the company is relatively immature in terms of BI, will be uh, very, very easy to ramp up and get there for companies that have been exposed or probably has access to other technologies like Tableau, there's still functionality wise or, or eye candy wise, uh, maybe a lot of difference between what you can do in Power BI and what you, what you can do on, on um, uh, Tableau, for instance, Spotify or other, other type of companies, uh, other type of, of products. So I, I would say it's, it's hard to you know say this is the target. Obviously, you ask Microsoft, they will say they are targeting everybody under the sun, right? Any other questions? All right. Um, let's see what is next. I think we're moving demo. Okay, let's see how this tool works, okay? And again, this is gonna be around, I'm gonna be using the Excel experience, and I'm gonna be working with data, okay? Data used to be very boring. Now it's very sexy, right? It's the new currency. If you know, if you can speak data, you probably can pocket extra extra dollars on, on, at your job. So let's see how we can make this work, all right? So we're gonna start in Excel. Once you download a Power Query and install it, you're gonna have in Excel, I'm using Excel 2013, you're gonna have a new uh, tab here called Power Query, okay? So quickly here, just a quick run through, you get a big tab for get external data. We're gonna explore that. Uh, you can combine uh, data sets coming from queries, right, Merge, Japan. Uh, there, is, there is a little bit of settings. We might explore that. And there is a My Data Catalog Queries. I think I'm, uh, because I'm using Excel, Excel is still hooked to the old service, the Office 365. If I have a tenant on Office 365, they have Power BI, anything that I can do with Power Query, I can upload and share, okay? So I, I, I guess that's the high level uh, menu of, of Power Query. So few things, and, and this always demos well, and I haven't rehearsed this part of the demo, so let's see how that goes. It's the online search, right? And I'm connected to internet. So, so I, can, I can probably uh, Google, uh, Google, I'm sorry, search for, for data. Uh, and, and it's like looking for data, um, I don't know, like uh, unemployment by state. Okay, and suge he suggests searches like you, when you're doing it on, uh, on, on, on your internet search. And you get results, and if you hover over the results, you get these little flyouts with a little bit of the data sets there. Whether you, you know, this is coming for the World Bank, you have some, uh, the description, the metadata about the, the, the columns. Uh, you can decide to load that data inside of your workbook or you can decide to bring a query and start playing with the data, okay? Now, I, I say this demo as well because it's pretty cool, right? I tip a, term, a search term and it goes out. It doesn't go out in the wild. It goes out to a catalog that Microsoft owns and operates and I guess they, have to keep, they want to keep some certain control into what things or what data sources you wanna search. Um, so you see a lot of results here from the World Bank, from Wikipedia, and, and other big data-centric uh, um, uh, services available. But honestly, I don't know how useful is this on the, on, the, on the real world, because typically, what are the chances that you're gonna find the data that you need for answering a business question, unless that you're looking for weather data or cer certain data that is just uh, available on the, 
uh, uh, open on the on the public. Okay, so that that's for one. Uh. So let's close that. The next part, and this is probably where we're going to start. Let's let's start with with some something a little more structural, or something more that you can relate to your day-to-day -day job. Uh, we're going to start. We got a request from a business user saying, "Hey, I need data about my sales uh, and um, sales by reseller channels, right?" And we know that we have a data warehouse that is hosted on a SQL Server database that we have in house. Okay, so you can go to your from database tab and say, "Well, here is are all the data sources or databases that are supported, right?" And you have all the way from Teradata, Cybase, Progr uh, Postgres and all the major database engine, okay? And I might be not running the latest version because I know that, uh, that now we have uh, the ability to get data from an ODBC data source. So if it's not on the list, but you have an ODBC driver, then you can get to it as well. So in this case, let's keep it simple. We're, we're gonna use SQL Server. And I believe my instance is called SQL 2012. It's, uh, I'm not going to enter the database name because I want you to see the whole menu. Once you provide the database name, you have the ability. And I can zoom in any time uh, that you guys need to see something bigger. Let me know, and I'll, I'll be happy to zoom in. So here, here I have my Adventure Work is the name of my company. And this is the data warehouse. And when I click on that, I have access to all the objects that somehow provides data to us. And, and in the database can host a lot of different type of objects. In this case, we are uh, interested on, on views and tables. So when I asked the question, oh, but which table it is, somebody told me that it's the factory seller sales. So I find my factory seller sales table, and, and I want to validate if this is what I need. They, they asked me for a report of sales by month uh, by reseller. Okay, and it looks like this is this is what I need based on all the description, uh, the names of the columns that I see. When when I when I'm finding what I need, I can click edit, and a second um, editor opens. This is the query editor. Okay, now it's connecting to that data source, bringing the data, presenting it, presenting a sample of that data, and some capabilities to play around with it. Right. So um, the first thing is when you're working with data is probably you want to get rid of the noise, right, of things that you don't need. So let's use the choose column functionality. And, I, and let's just pick what I need. I, I need the order date, because the report is by order date, somebody told me. Uh, I'm going to need the sales amount. And I'm going to need probably something from the related tables, OK? Uh, let's do the reseller table, and let's do the order date table, OK? So as you can see, related tables are represented here. And if you use this option, you are able to see all the columns that are related to that. If you are a data guy, think about a join. And how the Power Query knows that that's join? It's reading the metadata from your database. If you define foreign keys, if you define that little lines that goes between tables, he knows how to get to it. We have yeah, a. That was my question. Yeah. So the user never sees the join. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You could do it. So the question is. Uh, about joining two tables or, or merging data from 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 two th through different tables. If you do it this way, it's going to use and force you to do an inner join. If if you're not happy with that, then don't use this functionality. You just build. We can. I'll show you how you can build two queries and then you have control into how to join those two tables. Okay. Um, all right, so from this table, I know that they like to see the, the business key of the reseller, and I know they want to see also the reseller name, okay? So you can start picturing the final report. It's like, give me the aggregation of sales, maybe by month or by date, by reseller. And I made a mistake. I said I wanted, I wanted the month and the year. All I brought was the, the order date. So let me fix that 
by coming back to the remove column steps and make sure that I am selecting the order date, okay? And now this table, oh, I thought I have clicked on this. So we're bringing the name and we're bringing the alternate key and it's expanding it. And I'm gonna do the same here. On this table has anything that has to do with the date. So I have the name of the month, which is, comes handy when, when the report only wants the name of the month and the year is not interested on the, on the whole date, okay? And, and here we have with few steps without having to write any query or any code or any macro, we have started manipulating data. We haven't done anything really major to say, oh wow, I, can't, I, I couldn't do that before, okay? But there, is, there are also functionality. If you, if, you, if you let me zoom here for a moment, you will see that there are repeating values, right? So the same date, at the same year, with the same retailer, uh, oh, and I'm missing oh, a different amount. It's because the granularity of this data is one record per transaction. Typically on a report, you wanna summarize that. How do you summarize that? Well, you, there is a little bit of uh, uh, some, some small functionality here called group by. Uh, sorry, uh, let me do something here. Okay. Oh, and I broke something here, all right. So, so because I came back and I added something halfway through, that broke my last step. Not to be afraid, you have, you have the ability to delete a, a, a specific step. And I'm looking into what I might be missing. Okay, I'm still missing. Okay, let me, let me go back here, I think. Okay, I'm just redoing the last step, guys, because I did it out of order. So let me just catch up here quickly. English month name and calendar year for this. And for the reseller was the alter, the business key, and the reseller name, okay? So I was going to show you, or I'm going to show you how to do the, the group by, right? And you have different tabs, so I'm gonna use the group functionality. All you have to do is probably to click all the columns that you want to group by, and a, a new editor is gonna ask you, okay, how did you wanna group the data and what did you want to aggregate, okay? So I'm gonna say, I, I wanna group by by the dates, by the month, by the year, by the reseller uh, attributes, and I want to create a sum of the sales amount, okay? So you select the sales amount and say, total sales, this is the name of the new column, and then boom, you have it here, okay? So once you have this, you can say save and, clo uh, save and load, and it will load the data into your workbook, okay? Now, this is just very quickly getting data from one table, joining to two tables, not very exciting. But what really, what, what happens very often is that the requirement doesn't come that easy, right? Typically say, you know what, this is great for creating a report, and, and let me just show you how quickly you can create a report here with, with uh, Power, uh, B, Power View. You go to Insert, uh, Power View, It's loading the data into that in-memory data model and it's bringing Power View. And it's showing you an initial view of all your, all your fields, right? It's making a guess that you want to aggregate certain fields. Um, so you can just probably, this is easier if you delete this and start from scratch. And you can start creating something like, uh, okay, reseller name and the total sales. Uh, maybe, you created a little bit of a bar chart. Okay, and here you have it, all your cells. But they're gonna complain, say, you know what? I don't really look at my cells, but individual resellers. I look it by the groups of resellers, 
right? And you just ask, well, what is that column on which table I'll put it there? And they come back to you and say, well, that's the column that you didn't get to time to add to the data warehouse. So all I have to do, all I have been doing around the business is maintaining that on Excel. So the typical uh, scenario is 80% of your data is on the database, the 5, 10, 20% remaining is somewhere else, on Excel sheet somewhere, okay? So they, they show that to us and they say, here, we, we have been maintaining for the last two years uh, the, the resellers and, and some, so, some sort of kind of, uh, right? Okay, this is how we typically uh, classify, ah, where does my mask go? Okay, let's, let's back. Okay, so you have your resellers that are tier A, that rock, and the resellers that are not doing that well, and this is how I report on my information. Can you fix that for me? Okay, I say, well, I'm, I won't do it, but I'll show you how to do it in Excel yourself, right? Because this is, again, this is the end user friendly type of experience, and then at the end you tell me if you agree or not. So what we're gonna do is now, back to Power Query, we're gonna create a second query. This time we're gonna say from a file, and we're gonna say from Excel, okay? And that Excel file, we're gonna look for it, it's on the, on the desktop of the business user somewhere, yeah, it is. And it's gonna connect to that Excel book and it's gonna present it similarly that it presented all my databases with all my tables. So the, the experience is very consistent, right? So I have two tables, if you will. I know it's the first one, right? Or if I don't know, you can always use the fly out and find out. Yeah, it looks like what he just showed me. I can double click and I bring the same editor, right? Now, typically, you have to do certain things, right? Power Query didn't recognize the first column as a header. We can fix that by using the button that the, fu the function saying use first row as a header. It looks like that's the only thing that I have to do, okay? And now I can, I can probably just close and load this. Now I have two queries, okay? Now you're asking, well, but I need it all together, okay? So you can create a third, a third query to bring it together or you can go to the first one because when you come to the first one, you have this new tab that recognizes new queries, okay? And now you can say, um, I'm looking for my merge, okay, merge queries, okay? Um, you can say, let me merge two queries, and it allows you to select any other query that you have on your board book, uh, and then select how you wanna join it, and to your, to, to, to your earlier point about inner joins or outer joins or give me everything that is on both places versus give me everything that is on one place but not on the other, you have the ability to say include matching records or uh, only include matching records or just do an outer join, okay? Um, so now you do that and you have a new column that I didn't bother to rename, so let me just rename this hierarchy, okay? And you have the ability to expand that. Now I'm interested with the group and the subgroup. And now I have the same, the, the data set, the original data set with all my sales information from the uh, data warehouse. And now I have this from, from Excel. I can close and load. And now I can go back to my report and add it and, and hopefully will will be good. And just to show how easy this thing is for refresh, well, what this, this is what I do in Excel today, yeah? But I bet you money that, unless that you put a lot of elbow grease, you have to redo it and repeat yourself every time that the data changes, right? It's a lot of manual, uh, manual labor involved. Now, what happens if all the student I wanna, instead of tier A, uh, um, let's, let's call it tier one, okay? You're, re you're, you're really doing an update, if you will, on, on your data, right? Oh, I didn't go that, right? So, uh, okay. See, I'm Excel challenge. Okay, let's say that you're just doing that quick update here. Uh, so now the A should change by one. All you have to do here is click refresh, right? 
And if you were paying the cloud service, maybe this is uploaded, and then you can schedule that refresh, right? Uh, okay, didn't work because, did I save here? Maybe it didn't, let's try again. If not, you would have to believe me. There you go. So now there is no more, oops. There's no more tier A, is, is, uh, tier A, now it's tier one, right? So the end user can just change the data, add the source, refresh their workbook, because typically you will have complex queries, okay? If you're doing just a simple join and two or three steps, hey, maybe there's not much of the saving, but typically you have a lot, a lot more work to, uh, involved to do. Uh, now it is a break time. How are we doing with time? I'm fine with, yeah, I'm saying, yeah. All right, so we're going to take a 10 minutes break and then we'll be back. Good questions over the break, so uh, let's see. So, so far, being able to connect to two different data sources, now you can, you, if you have more data sources, you just keep connecting and bringing data in form of queries, working your way through uh, data transformation, group buys, and any operation that you need to do until you are happy with your end results. But I got a question over the break, like, okay, who's the target user for this tool? It's really end user? You say, well, let's define end user. Uh, Microsoft called them information worker. Honestly, I don't think this will be for the entry level Excel users or for the entry level analysts. You have to be comfortable around data. You need to know your data. I, uh, another comment that I got over the break is, you know, working with duplicates or doing data scrubbing is really hard. Yeah, it's really hard. This is just a tool that might facilitate that work, but behind that tool there has to be knowledge, knowledge about your data, about what you're doing, and know all the data, uh, are, know all data sets are created equal, right? There is a lot of context, where is the data coming from, what, what a duplicate, you need to define what a duplicate is before you can even remove it. So just keep that in, in, in mind. Uh, when, when thinking about who should be using this data. But, so let, let's, let's revisit something here. Uh, let me open the, the query editor because I wanna point out uh, a few things, right? By default, this is the view, but you saw me probably uh, using the query settings. If you look at this uh, window or pane and on the right side, it really records every step that we are doing. And I don't know if you notice, but you can almost click on one step and it replaces for you all the data transformations that they are doing. I think this is very powerful, very helpful, especially on that case where you have the novice user or maybe the more experienced user or the IT. So if this doesn't look right, it's a lot easier for us to come here and say, okay, let me play uh, you know, step by step and see where things are going off track or what 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 broke the query, okay? So so you have all that, okay? Another thing that you have is the advanced editor. As you start transforming data and clicking here and clicking there, Power Query is, is creating a query behind the scenes, okay? This might scare you at first sight, but it's somehow readable. This is uh, M, is the language behind Power Query, okay? Uh, why is M? I don't know, but that's how they call it, okay? Um, it's somehow readable, it's a functional language, okay? Um, this allows you or give you access to probably start learning the language because there are certain things that might not be exposed through the UI, through the options, but the, if you review the language reference that is, uh, that is online, you can see that there are a lot more functionality that you can just roll out, roll, uh, you can roll your sleeve and start working uh, your way through code, okay? So it's not just that um, little user interface and if it's not on the interface you cannot do it, there's some code and advanced functionality going behind the scenes, okay? So uh, I wanted to uh, address that. Um, okay, back to our data problem. How many times it has happened that, okay, the, the data is good, I created the report, and then, oops, uh, because we didn't know our data, they told me, but you know that we sell products on different countries and we record sales on different currencies, right? And we were, that report is not gonna look right when we start aggregating Canadian dollars, US dollars, Greek, uh, I think we have like two or three different, I keep losing my mouse pointer, okay. We have 
quite a different currencies here. So we have to be careful with that. So know your data. So what? Somebody called us and that report doesn't look right, okay? Seems like uh, the amounts are off and it's because we learned this. Now, how many times have you asked, oh, sure, I mean, we just need to uh, apply some uh, conversion factor and we'll be done. So, and you ask, and what is that data, okay? I said, well, we got it on a flat file and then they show you something like this. Let me see if, uh, okay, here. And, and the deal, it turns out that they have one flat file for every month, right? So I don't know the Excel, that Excel advanced user how they will do that. I know it's not, it's not a super complex problem, but it's not a trivial problem where your data is spread out across different files. All the files are identical. So let's open one and, and see what it looks like on a text editor. And it uh, seems like a more or less CSV file, okay? Let's see how Power Query can help us on this scenario, okay? And let's get it to the more advanced level on Power Query, okay? So it's not just point and click, maybe we need to write a little bit of code, okay? So the first thing is, is let's go back to Excel, and now let's create another query. In this case, we're gonna go from the file, and we're gonna say, well, let's bring data from a uh, text file. We need to go where that, those text files are. Uh, desktop, here. <laughs> All right, so let's pick the first, the first file from the, from the list, Power Query Connects. And he, he, he tries to guess and add some steps here, and I'm receiving immediately here some errors, okay? But like I said before, you can always remove steps until you get to what the error is, and you still have errors. Let's see what he's doing. He's, he's, he's still looking at the extension of the file and say, I'm gonna treat it as a CSV file, and what happened is that that file is not a, a proper formatted CSV file. So let's change it to text file, and now we have the data, okay? But we have the data on a less than useful, useful format, okay? There are a lot of things. We have header records. If you scroll down, you have some uh, footnote records, okay? Four records at the top, four at the bottom. Everything is on, in, on one column. So let's work through some data cleansing on this to, to make the, 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 uh, this data set available and ready to use, okay? So first, let's remove rows. Remove top rows. We know we want to remove four rows. Boom, done. We want to remove the last four. Remove bottom rows, four, remove. Now we want to probably split the columns and if we look closer to the data, oh, not that close. Let's see. We know that there is, seems to be delimited by comma, okay? So let's go to the split functionality by delimiter. We're gonna say it's a comma delimited file. Start, starting to look a little bit more uh, useful. Let's remove the la this last column because it was empty. The f the each uh, record was finishing with a comma. Now let's use the other functionality that says um, use the first row as a header, okay? And it's almost there. Why is almost there? Because if you think about using these, our other data set has one record per cell transaction, and that cell transaction has that currency. This data set has one record per date, and on that record has the exchange rate for all the four uh, currencies that I'm interested in, okay? It's almost like I, I need to unpivot this, right? So I heard that unpivoting and doing, doing on pivot, pivots and on pivots on Excel wasn't that easy. I heard that some, sometimes you have to write uh, some macros or do funky stuff. Well, Power Query uh, allows to do this a little easier. Let's select the columns that we want to uh, on pivot. Uh, let's find the on pivot function. And now it's that easy, right? One record per day, per currency, and your value, okay? So last thing is maybe this attribute, let's rename it to currency, okay? 
The other thing that doesn't look that good is the values here is USD slash, USD slash, and then the currency. So let's remove that so it's a little easier to understand. Replace values, USD, and we're gonna replace it with nothing. So now it looks something like this, right? The last thing is make, maybe making sure that this value is numeric, okay? And you have somewhere on here the data type is treating this as, as a text, okay? So let's make sure we say it's a decimal number and it's done, okay? Because I know my other data sets, um, where are they? Okay. Because I know my other data set has the date value, but it has it on a, on a format of year, month, and they without slash, and I want to join that, let's clean this column as well, but again using the replace values, and we're gonna replace all the uh, hyphens, and now we have this, right? Now, two or three minutes, look all the code that we wrote, or well, the Power Query wrote for us, right? Uh, again, the advanced editor, you can see all the data transformation steps, or you can click here on all the apply steps and go, you know, move by move, how did you get there, okay? And now you have here the content of one file. We have three years worth of files, okay? Uh, the regular Excel user will attempt to do this 36 times or whatever, how many files you have, no fun, right? So. This is where probably we're gonna try to, to look into some level, uh, increase the, the complexity here and, and teach uh, or show a trick to reuse the M code, okay? So on this case, you have the ability, in M, you have the ability to create a function. A function is no more than a programmatic unit that you can pass a parameter and it can execute the same, the same transformations over and over, okay? So what I would like to do is to, to take this uh, this code that loads and, and transforms uh, the data from one file and turn it into a function so that, that I can call it for every file, okay? So I don't have to repeat myself 36 times. What I'm gonna do is to invoke a function 36 times, right? So the way to do that, relatively easy. You come here and you go to the advanced editor and this is if you look at this what I would like to parameterize is the name of the file uh, the first line of code has that information right table from columns lines from binary files contents ah here, here you go so the C users Rafael OneDrive personal presentations blah 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 that's the path to one of the files. So this is the line of code, only one line of code that we want to parameterize, right? So for that, we go at the, sorry, no IntelliSense, so any Visual Studio uh, junkie here will feel offended because you have to type and there's no IntelliSense here say, telling you what is wrong. Um, so we're gonna declare the name of the function. Uh, so function currency and then we're gonna type the name of the parameter, file name, as text. Okay, Oop. We're gonna assign the parameter to this code. Okay. There are still a few areas of improvement on, it, on this part of Power Query. Uh, now, I have declared a parameter. Now it's a matter of just using that parameter here. Let's replace the file name, hard coded with, oops, with the name of the parameter, which we call file name. Okay, yeah. I will add. Let me make sure there are no errors, and then I'm gonna zoom in. So a few changes, okay? File, yeah, so okay, yeah, there is not, uh, there is no spelling, a speller check here in M either. So the, the changes, oh, sorry, let me froze this. I declare it here, okay? Whatever you put here at the top, you have to close it here. 
I'm um, calling uh, the name of the function as currency, and then I'm using the, the, oh, the parameter here. Okay, those are the three changes that I did, except that I have a typo that I will correct before clicking OK. So, okay. Now, uh, thanks, Michael. All right, let's see if it works. Ah, at least it recognizes. Now I'm on Power Query, and now it's, it knows that there is a function and that there is a parameter called file name that is a text. Okay, and now I can invoke it, and I just need to put the file name there. Uh, let's see how can we do that. So this is the path. And let me provide a different file. Let's do a 2006 file name this time. If you click OK, boom, here are the results. So same query, now applied, applying it to a second file. We're not home yet because, OK, does that mean I have to click invoke 36 times? It's a little better than writing the query 36 times, but still not that great. OK? But this is where you know a little bit of creativity and knowing the tool will help you because now you know that from file there is a different option called from folder and all you have to do on, on this is to point to any folder let's see uh, when I want to go to my desktop uh, how do I get my desktop here ah oh, thank you uh, okay hmm I don't see, okay, let me try something different here. OneDrive, all the way down. Okay, a little bit. I'm looking for all my files, which are like seven directories deep. Uh, Power Query, almost there. Change files, all right, found it. Okay, if I do that, it's gonna to connect to that folder and it's gonna bring everything that is on that folder, right? Everything in the terms of what objects, what files I have there, right? So if you resist admin and you start thinking, hmm, maybe you can use this to automate to do things one time for every file that I have, yes you can, okay? So all I'm interested here is probably the folder, path, and the file name, okay? So let's just remove everything else and we look the name and we look at the path Okay, it's looking like what I need. Now I need everything concatenated, so I'm, co I'm gonna select the two columns. And I'm looking for my merge columns function. Uh, no separated, separator, and a name for the column. Okay. Um, okay. So now I have a, yet another query called all files, okay? I'm gonna load this, and you guys know where this is going? We have one record here for every file. I have 36 files or 32 files. Now all I need to do is to invoke that function for every record here, okay? How do we do that? Okay, let's come back here. Now we're gonna add a column Okay, let's make this visible. We're gonna add a column, which is a custom column. And that column is gonna be called, hmm, query one, I guess. I didn't change the name, I didn't put a friendly name to my function, it's called query one, right? And if I remember correctly, it's only one parameter. Let's see if this works. Ah, seems to be working. Okay, it added a, cost, cost, a column column custom because I didn't change the name, and it's presenting it as a table. That means there are fields underneath. And underneath, you have all these fields, which are all the fields from those files, right? So you just have to uh, expand this, and now you have it here for all the files, okay? Does this make sense? 36 files loaded via function to this. So a few things 
to reflect here. One is, does the end user can do this? No, but this is where probably the security job is going to pay. We will do it for them, okay? We're going to tell them it's going to take us three weeks to do. We'll get back to you, but after you're done, you just have to call this function, hit refresh, we'll do it for you every time, okay? Until you break it, and then I have to come back again. Um, anyway, uh, you have the ability to create more complex functionality and, and, and encapsulate that logic and deliver pieces of, uh, of code that probably are, are more end user friendly, okay? Uh, the same applies for other things, right? I was playing earlier. Now, let's, let's, let's look at, at other examples. I was looking, so uh, Power Query has the ability to connect to the internet and bring data from the internet from uh, Web, ser uh, web services, APIs, a lot of different things, right? So we haven't explored all the options, but look how rich this is, right? SharePoint list. I don't know any SharePoint users here. How easy is to extract data from those SharePoint lists, right? Not very friendly, uh, unless that you have the knowledge of the right tool. All data feeds. Hadoop, somebody, somebody was asking me about this big data platform that is big time. Yeah, Hadoop, you can connect to HDFS and get data from Hadoop. You can sysadmins for an active directory. I show one of my demos, this is my personal machine, so it's not uh, joined to any domain. One of my demos on, on my other uh, computer is to connect to active directory, giving a name, give me all the groups of that, 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 uh, that uh, ID account belongs to. Given an give, uh, AD group, give me all the uh, members of that group. Little, little things like that. And at least a couple of sysadmin approach me and say, hmm, that's sparking some ideas. I seek how can I automate or maintain certain things on Active Directory using this. Um, you can connect to Exchange, right? And, and maybe extract data from an attachment or the text or the data from that is on an attachment on an on a email that account that you set up for certain for certain purposes. You can get data from your Facebook, okay? How many likes have you had in the last few uh, months, right? Uh, I haven't used the Facebook functionality, but anyway. Cool, cool, cool things like uh, uh, business objects, okay? Um, Salesforce.com. Oh, here is my ODBC, so they put it under here instead of the databases. Uh, if you have an ODBC driver, surely you can probably connect. How friendly is going to depend on that provider of that data source. Uh, um, or you can start a query from, from, from blank. So I was looking or playing the other day. There is this website that uh, publishes um, a feed for all the um, conferences, SQL Saturdays. Um, uh, that, uh, that I tend to go at least three or four times a year, but I always go to the ones that hope happens all over the world, a lot of them on the United States. I try to hit only the ones that are within four or five hours driving distance, right? Because I want to keep my speaker uh, cost uh, expenses a little, a little low. So I always find, uh, uh, was trying to find a way, well, let me see what are the, the places that are closer. Well, what if you could take an address and make call something like the Google API for driving directions and, and make calls? So Power Query can consume the data and you can out start automating things like that, right? So this is an example of that API, right? This is from, from Google. You can do it from Bing as well if you want to keep it Microsoft friendly. Uh, this is from going from Charlotte to Miami. It's going to take me around 10 hours, 26 minutes, and it's going to, you know, around 738 miles, okay? So all you have to do, for instance, is just take this URL, take this URL and go into Power Query, and you can say, let me get data from the web, okay? It's going to connect and it's going to try to to find a structured data on that website, right? It could be a, the HTML, an HTML table, it could be a, an XML formatted like this one, and then you can just expand this. Okay, yeah. Uh, let me expand this. Expand this. Okay. And here I have the same data now nicely formatted here, okay? Now, 
Do you remember the other trick that I showed you where we could have multiple multiple records and call a function? You can encapsulate this call to the Google API into a function, and now you can pass or, uh, uh, point A and point B and have the, the distance. Are you gonna make money doing this? I don't know, but you might make money so uh, fixing or making uh, problems that deals with API, calling APIs. I mean, you say API and end user, and that doesn't mix well, right? Typically, it's us, they're the ones that have to do it. But if you say, here is a function, pass these parameters, and you show them how that, that passing the parameter or giving some uh, queries template, maybe you can, you are able to take that user a little bit further uh, along. And you can do it with XML files as well. Um, so I'm, and before, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up my demo and probably go, going through the last, the last uh, few points that I wanna make. But I'll pause here in case you have any questions about the tool itself. Yeah? All right. So let's switch gears. Where is my Prezi? Ah, here. All right, so we were here. Okay, let's, let's do a, a, a recap about this, okay? We say uh, rich data transformations, and I call it rich, we just scratched, this, uh, scratched the surface. There, there, are, there are a lot of functionality embedded on all those menus. If you run, if you run out of uh, uh, functions and buttons on that menus, there is a huge language reference for you to write your own code if you wanted to. Intuitive, well, let's define the target, the target user, okay? If you are comfortable in Excel, if you are comfortable on running and messaging and transforming data in Excel, you probably will feel, feel somehow comfortable uh, using Power Query. Ways to, go, to extract complexity. Ah, that reminds me that I skip a demo. Anybody is familiar with SSIS, SQL Server Integration Services? Next summer. <laughs> Next summer, I'm hearing. Okay, glad, glad. Yeah, because he's taking a class, I heard. <laughs> so, so anyway, SSIS is the, is the uh, heavy tool for doing ETL, right? It's what the developer will use to build this ETL system that will run on a scale. So it's built and operated by, by IT, okay? But there are, there, are, there are also functionality inside of SSIS where you can deploy a package or a unit of ETL, expose it as a view to an end user. Well, you, end users don't know about packages, scheduling, running packages, they will probably uh, look at you like what you're talking about. But you talk about a user about, uh, uh, you talk to a user about a, ta a table or a view that you can do select star, maybe you can get them a little closer, right? So you can deploy your pieces of ETL as a, a, in the server, expose it as a view, and then you can use Power Query or a simple query to say, hey, so let's start from, he doesn't know he's running a package behind the scenes. He doesn't have to, right? And that could be a way for you also to extract certain logic, to control, to ex exercise certain control over the data that you are exposing, okay? So start thinking about, about ways to abstract and deploy this. Just, just don't bring this tool tomorrow to your office and say, you don't have to ask me for data anymore. Here is the tool, right? You have to start thinking about, okay, it's not only the tool, but it's also there are, there are processes, there is knowledge that needs to happen also to, to do things to work, okay? The refresh, reuse, and share scratch, it, scratch the surface because we didn't look into what is available when you are on the cloud, when you use the cloud component, okay? We didn't have time, uh, and one hour wouldn't have been enough time to cover that part. But know that there are things that any query that I created there, I can add a description, and I can upload to a catalog. I can, I can uh, assign rights to who can consume certain queries. And the next time when they use that search functionality, one of the items on that search might be your own, the queries that somebody published. There is a certification process, which is just a check mark saying this is a, a certified query, meaning it's, it has been blessed by, any, by its IT or by a data steward, and it's safe to use. 
Um, so now the question is, self-service ETL, are we there yet? This is a question that I would like to pose to the group, right? We saw, we started saying ETL, it used to be and it has been, uh, has been done by, by IT, using IT tools that require specialty skills. Now we're trying to bring some of that functionality into the end users or power users. Are we there yet? Are we ready, this, uh, are we, uh, are we ready to bring this into prime time? I don't know what your opinion, any comments? Mm. They have learned how to write a function no. in, in this, and now you're saying to them, uh, they may know yeah. how to recurse a directory by doing a directory with PDA. Yeah. And now you're saying, no, 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 learn a new language, <laughs> right? That's you right. You can't do a recursive, you can't, I can't say, you know, read the file system and do it for each of these. you got to do it as a table, and you've got to learn M, and the function doesn't yeah. look like anything. I think there's going to be a lot of resistance. That, that, that's a great point. Re resistant to change is a natural thing, regardless of M or, or power. Yeah. If you have if you have a way to do it and you feel that you're efficient and you're accomplishing what you need, yes, it's going to be a tough sell unless that you bring these with some added benefit, right? Uh, it will be a tough sell, right? So. It is, to me, this could be, could start by just get another tool on your toolbox, use it if you want. That could be the starting point. The second one is see if there is any, if you can add any value, right? It's just like I said, don't take Power Query and put it in front of your end users. Is there any value add, right? Can you couple it with your uh, IT, ETL, SSIS, because you, you have that, and now there is a little more synergy collaboration on that front, okay? Can you, use it to extract certain things. I mean, you have to look for, for the value add, and it has to, it, it doesn't have to be for the heck of using a new tool, it has to bring some business value, right? Either you are able to make more money or save some money, okay? Business only wants to know how to make more money or cut, or cut on cost, right? Or can we do it faster and quicker? Can we probably cut the dependencies on, on some Asian, uh, Asian non-supported technology? That might be a starting point as well. So, but this is a great point. I mean, this is this is where, if we are the ones, I mean, and we, uh, mainly we're the technologists are the first one to learn about this new technology. Unless the end users are on, on a conference and saw, and see a cool demo, they're going to learn from us. So we need to play the sales the salesman role as well. Okay, is this going to save us some time or, or make our life easier or bring some benefit? for the greater community in the business, then let's have a conversation. Any, any other comments or questions? Oh, it's okay, go ahead. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll go over that, thanks, reminder. So, how I can see this um, plan, right? It, for one, I don't think this is gonna replace BI, the, the regular ETL on, on BI, but it could complement it, right? Like I said, Maybe our role start shifting to I publish data and I'll give you tools to consume that data, okay? And hopefully the, the starting point, uh, going back to the, to the uh, typical, to the, those users that use macros and all that, I don't know that everybody, any Excel user uh, is able to write a macro right away. There are a lot of very powerful uh, power users that use the macros on a, on, a, on a very powerful way. But the starting point of this type of technology tends to be a little bit more easier for people that is an, an entry level, right? There's a lot of uh, uh, point and click functionality. The other thing that you can make is, it's not only the Power Query experience to, okay, gather the data and have it in Excel, but also what about the other two components that we didn't cover, right? Once you have it on Power Query, being able to push it to Power Pivot, what was the number of records, the maximum number of records that we can fit on Excel? 2013, is it a million still? It's a million, okay. What if Power Pivot, you know, is bounded by the memory? Now, if you have eight 
16 gigabyte of RAM, you can easily have re uh, tables with billions of records, okay? It's, it's highly, highly compressed. So not only you have the data transformation, but after it's transformed, you can load it here where you can do a lot more and faster, okay? So value add. Um, what if it's, it's an all immersive experience that once you are happy with your data, now you can use Power View or any of the charting capabilities that can, you have available in Excel to be able to publish that, right? So it's kind of a, 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 a more of a full solution that could be your full, full, scale, full blown BI solution on, into a smaller scale, right? Think about a department with a limited uh, amount of resources or a small company. Data wrangling, and this is already a term being used by, by, by industry analysts, right? Those data junkies that use Excel or any other tools to do a lot of cool stuff and analysis, right? So it's yet another tool that you can use to, to access other data sources, right? Because again, not just for picking on the, on the people that write macros, but I don't know how easy it will be to connect to PostgreSQL or to Hadoop using a macro. Power Query has the connector, and I don't even know how it works behind the scenes. I don't have to. The other thing is prototyping ETL. One of my earlier points was that the ETL, building the, the formal ETL for a data warehouse consumes 60, 70, 80% of your budget, because it's hard. Uh, a lot of miscommunications around what the uh, end user thinks the data has and, and what we show them the data really represents. Right? So what if we can say, look, look, try to use this tool, prototype what you're telling me. Don't tell me how to join the data. Go and connect to the data, join to the data and show me. Okay? So you can even use it. I'm not saying prototyping. Maybe it's, it's a throwaway prototype because after they are done, I need to rebuild it on SSIS. Unless that you were hearing the, the uh, announcements on, on the Ignite conference that uh, SSIS and Power Query, now they are going to have an integration point. I, I, didn't, I don't have the details, but I could imagine maybe having SSIS or the ETL tool having an, an M data source. Okay, so you have your end user to prototype, build whatever that build, and then I'm able to consume that query uh, as an SSIS data source. That could be probably one scenario. It saves me time because end users know their data better than us. Okay, we need to be sometimes order takers. Okay, by the time that we take the order, by the time that we screw it up three times, they could have been done with the solution themselves uh, of write the query themselves the, uh, right the first time around. So that's, that's another potential lesson that I, that I see on this. Any other comment or question? All right. So before, before showing up tomorrow to work and say, all our data problems has been fixed. I saw a guy called Rafael with a great tool. Um, we need to make sure that it fits into the bigger picture. Call it architecture, call it workflows, call it processes, skill sets, right? Is this for everybody? Maybe it's not for every user, right? This is one of the questions that I receive. Is this for every user? No, honestly, I don't think so, right? There is a learning curve that needs to happen. But hopefully, the, uh, the value of, of being proficient with the tool uh, will be bigger or higher than the cost of learning the tool, OK? Tool limitations, well, this is still Excel, OK? And the data at the moment is being pumped into Excel. There is no, there is no other, other way. If you have the cloud thing, it will go to the cloud, but it will be some sort of Excel container on the cloud, OK? So there is no grow up. As, um, progression or grow up story into taking this into SQL Server, which in my mind would be the next natural thing, or maybe they were going to take it into Azure databases at some point. But it has to be that, that, that uh, progression story. It's just not there yet. It might be for SQL Server 2016, okay? And the other thing is we show a lot of things that, oh, look how quickly is this. Well, guess what? I know my files. I took the time to go through examples that will demo well within 5, 10, 15 minutes, right? And this is a lot, a lot of these things happens even when, when, they, when they, our executive or an end user goes and see a demo, look, that guy built an ETL package in, you know, 15 minutes. Don't tell me that it's going to take you three months to bring the solution. So let, let's make sure we, we make the point that data integration, data quality, data manipulation is not easy, okay? 
And, and it's not easy because we don't know the data, it's because working with data has a lot of caveats and, and it depends. And, and the data experts, it's not typically IT, the data expert typically are the business and we collaborate with them and we together build the solution. So that's another thing to probably be careful when looking at, at this type of things. Right, right. Well, yeah, I was demonstrating with clean data. Honestly, even if it's not clean, you wouldn't notice, right? We went through that that fast, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. So few few resources about Power Query. There is only one book that I'm aware of. This is my contact information that uh, as few of you guys ask me. That's my email address. So there is a wiki website maintained by, uh, well, put together by Microsoft. Uh, the Microsoft BI blocks are uh, on a different, uh, another venue to, to be up to date. Uh, Power Query, because it's an Excel add-in, um, that product group is, is releasing a new version of Power, uh, the Power Query almost every month, okay? They call it, this is the November version, the December version. So good thing is they are adding new functionality every month, but thing is if you are on a highly controlled environment, that's not gonna fly with you installing a new piece of software every month, right? So, good and bad. Uh, the next thing, ah, this is the shameless plug for my class. I'm teaching a class not on Power Query. I tried that last month, it didn't sell that well. I think it's, it's that new. So I'm, I'm going back to my roots and say, okay, let's talk about data integration, ETL done the way that IT does it using Microsoft tool, which is with SSIS, um, the Computer Technology Institute, and those guys were outside earlier. Uh, they have several classes on, on the data analytics tracks, even including SAS and stuff like that. But there is also a track uh, for, for SQL Server. I'm teaching this class in summer. And over the fall, I'll be teaching SSRS, I believe, SQL Server Reporting Services. So, and that's the end of my presentation, guys.